What's up, everybody? Welcome to the Ableton Music Producer Podcast. This is Dan Giffen, as always. Big shout out to Mr. Bill for joining the podcast. Been wanting to have this guy on the podcast for quite some time now. Yeah, if you don't know Bill Day, he is a brilliant producer, DJ, Ableton expert. He's got some great YouTube tutorials. Uh, he's worked alongside many well-known artists like Dead Mouse, Bill Gates, which we had on the podcast a while ago, Of The Trees, a lot of other artists that I really like. In today's episode, we talk about Bill's dream setup for a live future tour. We talk about apps and plugins that he's been finding recently. He talks about some things producers should consider when mixing, treating their bass. We talk about a lot of good random stuff in this episode, so make sure you stick around and listen to the whole thing. Before we jump into today's episode, I want to give a big shout out to Melodix, which is that desktop app I've been repping for a while. Uh, if you guys haven't checked it out, go to Melodix.com. That's M-E-L-O-D-I-C-S.com. And you can download it for free. There's a free trial. It's a great way to step up your skills practicing in the studio. You can plug in almost any MIDI controller, such as your Push 2 or just a MIDI keyboard or electronic drum set even. And you can practice your skills finger drumming, playing keys. There's a lot of different genres in there of music that you can practice to and have fun playing. So check that out. There's a free trial. If you want to do the subscription and save that piggy bank, then use the discount code LPO-20. That's LPO-20 and save that money. Also, if you want to join the newsletter, you'll be the first to get new episodes coming out for this podcast. Go to liveproducersonline.com slash newsletter. And if you don't own Ableton Live 11 or the newest version yet, go to liveproducersonline.com slash buy Ableton. I will hook you up with a mega discount. Last but not least, I would really appreciate it if you leave a review on Apple Podcasts or if you just follow on Spotify. Make sure you follow, like, subscribe to the podcast. It would mean a lot to me. Help me out big time. And without wasting more time, let's jump into today's episode with Bill Day, also known as Mr. Bill. I've been just drinking this espresso stuff lately. Actually, I can plug a company here. There's a, <laughs> this company called Bottomless. That's actually pretty cool. They send you a scale and then they send you bags of coffee to put on that scale. And then whenever you're like, whenever the weight of the bag is low, it like automatically sends you a new bag. Really? So, yeah, and it's like That's... just always different. So like currently I'm drinking some coffee by a company called Equator, which is pretty nice. And, you know, every week they'll, or whenever my scale is low, they'll just send me a new bag of some interesting coffee. So I don't actually really choose, but it's all good quality, like high, high quality beans. Yeah. No, that's actually brilliant marketing because you're not like on an Amazon subscription, like every month it's based on how much you're using. So that's pretty smart. Yeah, exactly. And the scale's like free. They don't like, there's no barrier to entry. They're just like, you just pay for your coffee and that's it. I mean, and in some weird way, that's kind of how Keurig made their business model too, because Keurig doesn't make much money off the machines, really. Um, They make a lot of their money off the coffee as well, because they have partnerships with a lot of these brands. That makes uh, sense. The packaging. Wait, so you still have to buy a Keurig machine though, right? You Which do. Is, yeah. That's yeah. like a one-time $70 fee, whereas like right. you spend like 20 bucks a week on Keurigs and then after three weeks, you've already spent more than the machine was worth. That's true. But I think most Keurig coffee tastes like shit, to be yeah. honest. So yeah, my mom loves it though. So good for her. But yeah, man, thanks for joining the podcast. I'm a big fan of your podcast. I've uh, been like listening to it for some time now. And I uh, love a lot of the guests that you have. We actually have like some estranged mutual friends like Gardner Beeson is like a good oh, yeah. friend of mine as well. I know he's yeah. done some video work for you back in the day. Yeah. Yeah. Gardner's sweet. He, um, he works, he still does work for me. We, we work on a project together called Beleagle Sounds, which is um, a sample company that I sort of started and he sort of runs all the A&R slash accounting for that company. Yeah, he's a busy dude these days. He just popped out a child. So I know he's got that going on. He's doing a lot of house construction, all that good stuff. Yeah. Yeah. He has this company called Easy Peasy Pro or whatever. Yeah. Where he uh, fixes people's decks up and stuff like that. It's pretty cool. Like he, the, the way he got into construction is sort of the way that I'm currently getting into construction. Um, he bought a house and then he was like, well, shit needs to be fixed around the house. So, you know, you can't just call a landlord and like pass the, you know, the buck on to somebody else. So you have to learn how to fix shit yourself. Yeah. Um, yeah. And I, I've, I've done a few things around this house since getting it, which um, one of the things was like I had to pull a window out and like replace a window. <laughs> yeah, that's a job. 
yeah, that was a job that took like a couple of days because uh, I didn't know what I was doing. Um, <laughs> in like doors in the house that I've like taken off and like flipped around because I wanted them to like open the other way and shit like that. Yeah, yeah. When I was when I was like graduating high school, I ended up uh, doing construction for some like job. I had no idea what the hell I was doing with construction, but I just basically lied and told the guy I did because I wanted the job. So I had to like Google my way through most of my projects. It was a complete disaster. <laughs> I mean, these days, man, like YouTube is pretty solid, right? Like if you're good at following instructions, um, yeah. YouTube has all the shit on it. That's I, true. That's you true. You can literally get like a college degree off YouTube at this point, I think. Yeah, pretty much. Yeah. I mean, you have a lot of great YouTube tutorials too. Shame, shameless plug is, uh, I find that like it's making music and like learning music through tutorials is kind of like a weird thing because i i feel like it's so subjective there's so many avenues that you could do it it's you pick up little tidbits but i find having somebody who's like a really good mentor for me personally has been like really helpful learning like a linear way of like from the ground up production with like mixing and mastering and things like that um yeah that makes san francisco san francisco okay uh, my geography is of california is terrible like i honestly don't even know how far that way that is but it's about an hour away. They're pretty close. Okay. Yeah, yeah. And you're like really into biking now too, aren't you? Yeah. Actually, I do a lot of that in Santa Cruz. Um, yeah. Santa Cruz is a great place for biking because it's like more mountainous. And San Francisco proper, there's like a few trails which are decent. Like Mount Sutro is really cool and Laguna Honda Loop is pretty sweet. But um, the the best trails are like you have to get out of San Francisco. You have to go north up to like, you know, Anadel or uh you know camp tamarind show or something like that or you have to go south to santa cruz and i mean you know like a bunch of um <clears throat> like actually companies that make mountain bikes are based in santa cruz like ibis and you know obviously the bike company is called santa cruz <laughs> right yeah yeah no i've always i'm low-key jealous i've always really wanted to get into mountain biking not only just for the exercise but i just think it's a lot of fun i stumbled i accidentally stumbled upon like some national convention for bikers uh, a couple years ago when i was camping with friends and it was like in this huge park called brown county south of indianapolis where i'm from and there was a uh, like literally a bunch of like five or six thousand dollar mountain bikes that you could just test for free and so I just gave him my license and I got to ride around for hours on like some crazy, super nice mountain bikes and fell in love. Dude, you can blow like 20 grand on a bike so easily these days. It's crazy. It is crazy. Yeah. Some of those bikes are worth more than my car. Yeah. I mean, my bike is worth more than my car. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, like, yeah, my bike is worth like $8,500 and my car is worth like three grand. <laughs> if you don't have to travel that far that often, like it's worth it, honestly. <laughs> Yeah, to me, I look at it like, um, you know, Dead Mouse is into sports cars, but I don't have enough money to be into that. So I'm like Dead Mouse light. I'm into mountain bikes. <laughs> yeah, yeah. You should get like a little side cart for your cat. You could take her places. That'd be pretty cool. She's currently attacking my arm. I see that. She's like, pay attention to me, dad. Yep. Here. <laughs> have you ever sampled her before? No, not really. I'm, I find like uh, sampling things to sort of be a little bit of a moot point or uh like a little bit um I, it's kind of pointless because you can just go online and find a sample of a cat right yeah. and it's like once you got a cat sample it's like how different is one cat sample to another that's true i guess from like that standpoint you're right but i guess there's the sentimental value of knowing it's your own cat exactly yeah people people want to sample things that they have around their house because like they feel some sense of ownership over it and i feel like some feeling some sense of ownership over your music is definitely important mm -hmm. um it makes you like value your own music more which is obviously important if you're ever going to want to promote it and stuff like that yeah. um <clears throat> but uh yeah from like the actual results standpoint i think it's like the same as if you just got a cat sample off freesound.org or whatever yeah yeah, that's true. I guess like, you know, I love, I love, I love my DW drum set, but I don't feel the need to like spend hours sampling my kick drum that I think sounds great. You know, if I can just find a billion other kicks inside the doll or other samples. Yeah. I mean, everyone's, I'm sure somebody has multi-sampled the exact kick drum that you have. Right. In a really nice studio with really nice microphones. Yeah. Have you played with the uh, session drums pack? It was recorded like just a shit ton of like drums, real acoustic drums. Uh, it's an Ableton pack. 
a oh, bunch of yeah, I have actually. Um, I haven't messed around with it a ton. Usually, what I use for um acoustic drums is addictive drums. Oh yeah, I think is amazing. I really, I only just recently got onto it, even though I know it's been around for a long time. Um, <clears throat> uh, before that, I was using uh, Superior Drummer, and then after that, I was using uh, Get Good Drums, the GGD stuff by Periphery or whatever. Yeah. Um, Oh shit! Hold on, that's that alarm. Hold on, I gotta go turn this breath. I'll be right back. <laughs> oh, you're cool, man. That yeah, we're good. No, it's cool. You gotta get that bread. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Speaking um, of bread, I actually heard a uh, saw a really funny tweet. My girlfriend, uh, like all of her music is music, or all of her music is food themed. So she goes under the name Snacks with like three X's. But she saw like your tweet the other day of you, and it was hilarious. Uh, it was something like, if you sell Indian bread. Uh, is that considered a non-profit? <laughs> well, that was, uh, that was hilarious. That was that's a, is that a pun? I guess. That would be a pun, right? Let's see. A pun is a joke exploiting the different possible meanings of a word or the fact that there are words which sound alike but have different meanings. Yes. Yeah, so that would that, be a pun. Yeah, it was a good pun. Yeah. What a punny cunt. It was punny. <laughs> um, yeah, so... I was listening to a podcast earlier today with Sam Harris and Ricky Gervais and Ricky Gervais was like saying how he thinks puns are like the worst shit ever. He Like <laughs> as a comedian, he's just like, I just don't understand how like you could lose your shit over a pun because pretty much all it does is like shows that you have understanding of a language. Mm. It's kind of like a slight misdirection. You're like, Hey, I'm going to like say this thing. And then you say like a slightly different thing. And everyone's like, Oh, cool. And then, like, I think, I think a lot of puns are directly related to dad jokes. I feel like I yeah. think that essentially lie in the pun realm. It does. Yeah. Yeah. For, I'm into it. I like dad jokes. So yeah, I kind of do too, to be honest. They're, they're good, like little hits of dopamine jokes, you know, like they're not full blown, like get you laughing your ass off type things, but they're, yeah. uh, they're good, good for little lulls. Yeah, uh, yeah. To, to answer your question about the, the drum stuff. Yeah. I was like using GGD and all that stuff mm -hmm. yeah i got i got into addictive drums for a little bit but i just couldn't stand the user interface i didn't like the interface that much i felt like it was a little janky especially mm -hmm. for like being able to split out the midi into <laughs> like a midi clip in live so i just basically ended up using the free trial and just sampled all of my favorite ones that came with it <laughs> Yeah. You know, one thing I really don't like about using uh, multi-sampled drum libraries in contact in Ableton is that the piano roll is never named. You know, like you'll, you'll go to like uh, produce a bunch of notes and you kind of have to just like drag the MIDI note up and down to figure out like where the kick is and where the snare is and all that sort of stuff. Yeah, yeah, exactly. You put something in drum rack and you like name the sample in drum rack. Mm hmm like names the piano roll as well. Right. I wonder if there's a way to like load contact into like one chain and then load a drum rack into a secondary chain on the same instrument rack, but then put samples of silence into each of those cells and name the samples of silence to try and name the piano roll for a contact library. Yeah, that would be really ideal. I would love that. If you find that, let me know. I feel like there could be like some kind of Max for Live device that like automates that somehow. Yeah, maybe. But uh, yeah, I feel like that's some shit that just needs to be in Ableton that is not for some reason. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I, I know you've been playing with Live 11, right? Yeah, I've been Live 11 for a while now. Yeah. What are what are your summer, some of your favorite upgrades that you've been using? I really like the scale thing and the clips. Like, yeah. It's super nice, I think, for somebody like me who's not really uh, well versed in music. To be like, all right, here's a D minor scale and then just like be able to draw it in super easy. Same. Um, that's cool. I also really like the randomization on the macro controls. Mm -hmm. That's kind of cool because you can just like macro map a ton of shit to something and then hit random and it's like, bam, random stuff. Yeah. Um, yeah. That's very cool. What else is cool? That That's like the two things I think I've been using the most. I also have been using some of the new devices, like Spectral Resonator is a fun one. Although I do think it's like, kind of like Corpus in the sense that it just like, as soon as you use it, like everyone knows you're using it now. It's like just <laughs> so Spectral Resonator-y that like, yeah. it's hard to use it and not be like, oh, that's clearly Spectral Resonator. You know, like Redux sounds very much like Redux or 
you know, erosion sounds very much like erosion. Um, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, no, definitely. I like to like do some of the MIDI from, um, and then just like run random sounds, especially like even with bass too, or sometimes I'll put on a return track and just get really weird with like using some like parallel effect with it. Mm. It's actually a lot of fun, but yeah, spectral resonator. I feel like it's a black hole. You could do a lot of stuff with it. You can um, for sure. Yeah, I've really been into the scale thing as well. Actually, before the scale thing was a thing, I was using Max for Live device called Scalomat. Are you familiar with that? I've seen, I, I think I can understand what it is. And like, I've seen similar things, yeah. Yeah, it basically, they just took like all of the scales that come in the push to, and they just like made it real easy for you to play the incoming notes automatically to lock in. But scale is yeah, Scalomat has like hyphens between it, Scalomat. I think scale at 4.2 is the latest update, but yeah, it's really cool. Cause you can break it out and have, I mean, there's just a lot of stuff you can do with it, but for anybody who doesn't have a lot of music theory, that's been kind of like my bread and butter for students that I always like encourage them to buy. And it's pretty cheap. Trying to load their website now, soundmanufacture.net, but it's slow as fuck. <laughs> it's like YouTube, it is. All right. it, maybe because it's just uh, so popular, everybody's on it right now. I have not seen this, but I've seen very similar things. Oh yeah, I love it. I'm a huge fan. I think it's pretty cheap too. Um, but yeah, for music theory people who struggle like myself, that's been my little hack. That and Mixed in Keys plugin, speaking of music theory, uh, Mixed in Keys Studio Edition plugin is really nice. <clears throat> yeah, where it just like high, uh, fills up the bar with energy that mm. is like the key of the track or whatever. It's like there's more of the D bar, so it's... A, yeah. a <laughs> exactly yeah it's like a little cheat code i like to use that for like tuning my kicks and my drums because then you could just see where that resonant frequency is really bumping and i just like transpose it until it gets into that little bar that's just wiggling up and down <laughs> yeah that's an interesting way to use it i usually just use um spectrum for that you like oh, yeah. it, it, and then like hover your mouse over the top and then down the bottom left hand corner of spectrum you can kind of just see what the note is and then you can obviously just pitch it around from there or you can use like a scale to note chart thing sorry a note, note to frequency chart or tuner tuner works as well i find like tuner's kind of weird sometimes maybe it's just the way i'm using it but i feel like a lot of times tuner doesn't necessarily like register with like kick drums especially <clears throat> i wonder if you like stretch the kick drum out so it's long it yeah work then and then you yeah can just again just to like stretching it might change the frequency i don't know i don't know yeah i guess it, it, you're right though it does work better on sustained notes for sure but yeah speaking of like samples and things uh congrats on your latest splice sample pack called spectra oh uh, yeah thanks yeah that yeah. was uh, just something i was doing because i was bored during quarantine basically i was like i haven't made a sample pack in a while maybe i should make like a massive sample pack yeah decided to just start like putting it together and then i like started going through all of my sound design folders all over the place and just realized that i just have so much shit laying around so i just started rendering stuff out and putting it it started as like a 100 sound pack that i was just kind of like put out for free with like some kicks and snares and shit and then it just sort of like kept going and going and like six months later i was like all right it's like a 1600 sound pack now or something yeah it was pretty big um i liked the demo track that you released with it too Thank you. That was really dope. Yeah, for sure, man. Uh, did you hit up Splice or did they hit up you and you just happen to have all that content? Um, so I've been working with Splice since 2013 and they initially hit me up uh, when they weren't even doing Splice sounds yet. They were just doing like the thing where you could collaborate with people or whatever. Um, I, I think it was just called Splice. Yeah, where it had like I think what they were trying to solve is like that version control thing. Uh, yeah. I mean, you worked on a project and I worked on a project. Like it would, I don't know, version Sick. control all the things. And, uh, yeah. So that that was like the where it was. And so I gave them a few project files back then to put in their splice system just to help them like kind of promote it. And then they were like, "Hey, we're doing splice sounds." So I like made a little sample pack um, and gave it to them and then like a few years later i think like three years later splice sounds was pretty massive and i already had a ton of sample packs on my website so i was like hey mind if i like you know put all of these on uh onto splice sounds 
And they were like, yeah, sure. And then I hadn't put a sample back out in like three or four years and then decided to put Spectra out, which was like basically as big as all of my past packs combined. Yeah. Yeah. No, I was planning on downloading it later and, and just fucking around with some of it. The, uh, <laughs> we actually had Danny from Splice um, on the podcast a long, long time ago. She's in charge of like their marketing. Super great company though. Nice. I don't know her, but um, I talked to mainly Aisha and okay. someone else. Matteo is another guy that I talked to there. Okay. Yeah. I don't know them. Hmm. Yeah. They're doing good things though. Um, yeah. It's great. I'm, I went to a Splice Summit that they held in LA once and they were just like, you know, giving talks there and stuff. And one of the facts that they threw out that I thought was really crazy is they've paid artists out something in the realm of like, 30 or 40 million dollars at this point which is oh. like a lot yeah and they just got um approved for series c funding for 275 million dollars i think wow uh, yeah that's huge it's i didn't know that they were playing with that much capital i mean it's not that huge of a team right i think it's it's a pretty small team that's running that the series c that they got was <clears throat> uh the the pre-money valuation was two hundred and twenty-seven million dollars, and they raised fifty-seven and a half million dollars. Good for them. Yeah. So they're whatever they're going to do with that amount of money, who knows? But probably something decent. <laughs> yeah, I would. I would think so. Yeah, I'd hope. Yeah, mm -hmm. I, I imagine subscriptions are doing well for them. I know that I have like what six thousand credits that I'll probably never actually use in my account. That just keep rolling over. Put them on Spectra. Yeah, put them on Spectra. Everybody go download Spectre right now. You've been told. Um, but yeah, I mean, we were talking about some of your favorite plugins and things and Live 11 um, with like Addictive Drums. Is there any other like new plugins or toys that you've been playing with for the last few months that you really liked? So I, I just get given plugins all the time and I haven't like really spent a ton of time in most of them just because, I don't know, I just haven't had time, but uh, the ones that I've been given lately that look pretty interesting is something called Bless Slow Machine, another one called M Voice One. Uh, there's a plugin called Enrage by Boom Library that looks cool. Um, oh, dude, Peel is fucking awesome by uh, I can't remember the company name, but um, oh, Z Plane is the company name. Uh, Pigments Three, I just upgraded to, and that that's really awesome. Oh, Pigments is cool. Yeah, that's a great synth. Yeah. Uh, Tantrum by Creative Intent is really cool. Yeah, Tantrum's great. I love Tantrum. That's really fun. Or no, I'm thinking of Tantra. I think I'm thinking of Tantra. Mm. Um, <clears throat> yeah, that's, that's kind of all the new ones that I've been given lately. But what have I been messing with lately? I've been messing with Vital a lot. I think that's pretty cool. I've also been messing with Faceplan a ton just because I'm making a preset pack for them at the moment. Uh, yeah, I know a lot of people have been talking about face plant. I haven't personally got into it much, but like what what do you love about it versus like serum or some other synth plugins? Uh face plant is just in way more powerful because uh I mean for starters the effects lanes, there's three of them instead of one on serum. Uh in terms of oscillators, there's just an infinite amount instead of serums three or four. Um, filters is an infinite amount instead of serums too. Uh, envelopes, infinite amount. Like there's just an infinite amount of everything. You can just keep creating YouTube. Stop biting my microphone. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, there's literally just like an infinite amount of like any processor you want, which is crazy. So it's really good for making, uh, like really, really intense sounds, you know, like if you want 500 flanges one after the other in face plant, you can do that. Yeah. Whereas there's, there's no way to do that in serum. That seems like a lot. I feel like at some point, it, like, what's the threshold of like just making crazy sounds for the sake of making crazy sounds versus like making musical stuff? I don't know. Well, I mean, there's different values in different kinds of music, right? Yeah. Um, like, if you want to talk about the most musical stuff ever, then it's probably classical music, right? But it's also the most boring sonically because it's just a piano most of the time. Yeah. Um, whereas, you know, sound design music it might be the least interesting musical stuff ever because a lot of it's just one note and a drum beat um but sonically it's like the most interesting ever and then you've got everything in between right yeah now that is one thing that's really cool about the whole sound design component is like 
you can just shape things and mold them like Play-Doh into a place where nobody ever is going to hear that same sound ever again. It's very Mm -hmm. unique to you. I don't know. I think that's really cool. And that's something that you do a lot of too. Like your sound design is very on point and I've watched a lot of your tutorials and like, actually you were one of the reasons I really started diving deeper into the sound design and doing more bassy experimental kind of stuff, uh, like several years ago. Um, and you did a, you actually came to Indianapolis the first time I met you or really saw you, uh, with Dylan Ill Gates, who was on this podcast a while ago. Oh, um, did we play a mousetrap? Was it called? You did. Yeah. So I didn't do the actual event, although I'm the Ableton user group organizer for Indianapolis, but I helped, uh, I helped do a little bit of promo, uh, I think Indie Mojo was the guy that held that event. So did but, I meet you at the um, Ableton event? Yeah, for like two seconds. You guys were like in and out for your yeah, show. That, that was cool, man. That that Indianapolis Ableton event was like pretty solid. Yeah, I was. I think at the time I was talking about mud pies, probably. Yeah, it was the mud pies. Yeah, yeah. maybe for people who don't know what your mud pies are, maybe share real quick. Um, so it's basically like you just make a bunch of random sound uh using any device you want uh it can even be a microphone or whatever it doesn't matter just use whatever is at your disposal to make a ton of sound and then you record a bunch of that sound so like you know in five minutes or something of that just random sound and then you just take little cuts of that audio file that you recorded and then work them into drum beats as like little sound design fills and stuff like that it's just like a really quick and efficient way to quickly get sound design fills happening in your music and eventually once you've created tons and tons of mud pies uh, you just have like this arsenal of like random noise sitting there like ready to be cut into tunes Um, and I found it's just like a pretty good way to you know get some pretty decent complex sounding sound design into your music quickly without like getting out of the flow of writing and also it like imparts some sort of randomness into your music which I think is kind of cool versus like being very intentional with your sound design, which is also obviously important and cool. But um, yeah, it's like nice sometimes, I think, to just like get those happy accidents going, both because, you know, you'll create things that you never would have created and they can possibly be like really interesting and cool sounding. Uh, But also it's just like good for creativity, right? Like if you're getting stuck or whatever, it's nice sometimes to be able to just like throw some stuff in and be like, cool, random stuff. Sounds good. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. Like in a, like a lot of that process as well is like you get that crazy mud and it starts to sound cool. And then you do a lot of freezing and flattening as well to that and just commit it. And I, I used to have really bad commitment issues where I would just be like, like, Oh, it sounds, I don't want to mess it up because I want to go back later. But then right. Yeah. Yeah. Or even Ableton's backup feature is really nice now too. I think that came out in 10, right? That was 10. Yeah. I think Um, so. Yeah, mud pies for the win, man. And actually, some of that mud pie making uh, with chopping up a lot of slices, I saw you on a live stream not long ago mention Resonic. Yeah. Uh, Resonic Pro. I actually haven't downloaded and played with it much, but I was kind of curious like, what you find the most value in using that because it seemed really interesting. Yeah, are you on Windows? Uh, no, I'm on, PC, or I'm on Mac, actually. Okay, they don't make it for Mac. Uh, well, then there goes that. So that's cool. <laughs> yeah. But uh, for Windows, it's sick. Um, you can like, yeah, just create like cut points in it and then say like render all these out to separate files. That's actually a way faster way to edit files down into multiple files than Ableton. Uh, and also it's just like nice to have access to your entire folder structure as an audio player. So it's basically just like Windows Explorer, but with an audio player built into it. Windows Explorer, like, you know, uh, the equivalent of like Max Finder or whatever. Oh, okay. Gotcha. Just imagine like Max Finder if at the top it had just like a waveform and like an audio player. That's essentially what Resonic is. That's pretty can, dope. Yeah, it just gives you access to like the, the very core of like how you interface with your system, but with a, with a sweet audio player and the ability to do editing and stuff. I wonder if they'll ever make a Mac version. I think he's trying to, but um, this is just sort of like a passion project Tom has been working on for a, you know, a long time um we, he was on my podcast actually we chatted about it basically i think he wants to like really nail down the windows version first because technically there's not even like a released version on online yet there's a resonic website and if you want a copy of it 
you literally just have to donate to his PayPal and then send him an email and be like, hey, I donated. Can I help? <laughs> like that's the only way to get it right now. There's no like checkout system where you can like actually buy it or whatever. Yeah, I saw that on the website. Yeah, so it's like really still in beta and it has been for a long time um, because it's just one guy making it. I think eventually he'll get to a point where he thinks it's like good to go as like a releasable thing. Um, and, and I think at that point he might be like, all right, now I'll concentrate on trying to convert it to Mac as well. That's cool. Yeah. It seems like a really valuable way to store your samples and to chop them up real time, real fast. Well, it's not a way to store them. It's just a way to access them. You would still just store them in folders, but then Resonic allows you to access those folders. I mean, so, but you find that like more valuable than just even previewing them in Live's browser. Well, yeah, because Live's browser doesn't give you much information, right? Like it shows you a tiny little waveform. Right. And that, with the with Resonic, you can like check the dates modified, the size of the file. Uh, you can like see the waveform a lot better. You can, you know, make little cuts and markers wherever yeah. you want files. You can really quickly like go through your folder structure and like access other you know audio files very quickly um, that seems really interesting yeah as far as like being be able to make quick slices that could be really nice cool man yeah well i'll look forward to that mac update i thought uh a while ago actually whose podcast was i forget it was on your podcast but you mentioned something about considering the m1 for mac i know you're like a hardcore pc guy yeah i think i do want to switch over at some point um just because do i it. really I don't like traveling with my PC laptop. Um, the MSI is like kind of bullshit, to be honest. Like the, the trackpad sucks, and like I don't know. It's a nice laptop, and it's powerful, and it's like it runs Ableton totally fine, and everything works and whatnot. It's just like kind of a pain in the ass to use on airplanes, and when you're traveling, you want convenience more than anything. And I think Apple is just kind of easy and convenient. You know, it's easy to yeah. just plug your AirPods in, and then bam, they're connected to your computer and all that shit. But um, in the studio, I think PC makes the most sense because you get to pick all of your ins and outs and you get to pick like every, you get to customize your machine exactly how you want it. Uh, and, and it's always going to be set up and good to go. Whereas on the road, you have to constantly unset up and set up and unset up. And you just want something that's going to be, you know, a little yeah. more stable and reliable than the PC system, I think. Yeah, I have a Hackintosh, so I've been able to have a little bit of the both. But I will say there's definitely something convenient about being on the road with a Mac because if you lose a dongle or if something breaks, your hard your hard drive hard drive takes a poop, your motherboard fries or something, you can go literally to any Apple store on the road in any major city and just buy a new one of the exact same thing. You don't really have that luxury with a PC necessarily when you're on tour. That's like <laughs> it could be a make or break situation. Yeah, that's true. Um, depending on how you how you're touring, like if you're playing off computer then yeah that's pretty important um sure, for me yeah. i'm not playing off a computer i'm playing off uh cdjs but it's just nice to be able to um yeah to be able to use your computer on planes and stuff like that and that's just not something i can really do with my msi yeah yeah well i have an m1 and honestly like i'm absolutely in love with it it's a weird feeling when you're, you're your computer's waiting on you all the time <laughs> like i'm literally clicking and i was like oh that's done okay it's just super fast amazing like how much quicker this new chip is with the release of the yeah. m1 i haven't had any problems with plugins the only problem i've ever had with it and all the billions of software i've downloaded and migrated is uh waves plugins which honestly i think suck anyway i'm not a huge fan but mm. so i've been very happy with my m1 if you decide to go down that that train love it i, I definitely will uh, it's just a matter of when i think i'm gonna wait until they've you know a couple of iterations in i think just with everything i, I always try and wait until uh you know something has gone through a couple of versions before jumping on board just to make yeah. sure they find out all the kinks right yeah i mean that's always a thing i guess with any new big releases hey just wanted to give a quick reminder to check out our friends from melodics Big shout out to them for supporting this episode. It's that awesome desktop app that you can download to your computer, plug in almost any MIDI controller and practice your skills playing keys, finger drumming, playing an electronic drum kit. A lot of cool lessons in there. So go to melodics.com and you can download the free trial. And if you decide to join the subscription, it gives you tons of access to lots of different content and trainings and a bunch of different genres and lessons. You can go deeper in stepping up your skills. So go to melodics.com. If you want to join the subscription, use that discount code 
LPO-20. That's LPO-20. Big shout out to Melodics for supporting this episode. We love them. And now back to today's episode with Bill. Um, well, you used to actually DJ in Ableton Live and you had, I thought you had some courses and things built around that as well, but now you're all CDJs. I'm just curious why, is it just because of the convenience or? Yeah, it's convenient. Um, and also building sets in Ableton just takes a lot of time. Uh, and I didn't think that I was adding much to the performance in the end. And I also don't think that people really gave a shit, you know, like nobody is down in the audience going like, Oh my God, like look at all those clips he's triggering. And like, Oh, did you just see that like scene that he triggered or like, right. you know, Oh my God. Like, <laughs> yeah, that's not happening. Right. Like people just don't, do not care. Um, and therefore I was like, well, if it takes a long time to build the sets and nobody cares and it's harder and I have to travel with more gear and I have to like do all this crap versus me being able to sit at home all week just working on tunes and then loading them onto my usb stick and going and playing them off a cdj and people respond even better sometimes because i'm playing new music more so than spending my time building sets yeah then you know why why wouldn't i do that um it's easier it's more more enjoyable for me more enjoyable for the crowd uh just makes a lot more sense yeah yeah, that makes yeah, it does make perfect sense. For me, I have CDJ NV because my setup doesn't have that luxury because I perform with a lot of live instruments as well. So it gets kind of weird trying to do a, a hybrid setup with live instruments with in ears on a CDJ. So I'm always jealous of people carrying flash drives. <laughs> totally. Yeah. I mean, I think um, at some stage I will, uh, you know, revert to computers if I ever get big enough where like I'm you know, want to do a massive live show or something like that with, you know, synced visuals and, you know, really interesting electronic music performance stuff and, you know, uh, jamming with other people and all that kind of stuff. And yeah, obviously like I'll stem all my shit out and I'll make a crazy session and, you know, create a, a cool performance out of it. But until I have essentially the amount of money coming in <laughs> from bookings to be able to make that make sense, it just makes a lot more sense to just play off flash drives. Yeah. Yeah. Cause I'm sure. like really to do the things that I want to do. Um, that would make sense with a live Ableton session with all those sync visuals and like custom stage setups and all that kind of crap. I'd have to be getting paid like 20 grand a show. And I just don't like, I get paid, you know, way less than that. Yeah. <laughs> so it doesn't make sense to, um, to do at this stage of my career. And yeah. it never makes sense. So we'll see. Yeah, someday though. I'll be at that show when you do. Um, <laughs> let me ask you, like, what is what is a perfect live setup? If you were getting paid, like say like twenty, thirty thousand dollars for a set, like and you could do anything, what would it what would it look like? I mean, I'd probably just go with um LED walls, uh more so than um than projection mapping, because projection mapping looks a little I don't know, it looks okay, but it doesn't look as cool as uh, you know, really high fidelity led walls um and i would be very, do that. sorry i was just going to say it's probably very venue dependent too yeah totally um but i would do that xr stuff you know have you seen that new um uh oh, what's his fucking name the guy who did old town road little nos x did you see his new film clip no Reason? it's crazy man it's like that is how i would make my live show it'd be led walls but um yeah Check it out real quick. I'm looking this up right now. Uh, you got to love YouTube ads. It's always fun. Yeah, it's um, Call Me By Your Name. So the way that this is filmed is like, uh, it's this shit called XR. And it looks like it's animated, but it's actually like LED walls and some weird like technology in Unity or whatever. But I don't think I'm watching the right thing. It's Lil Nas X Lights. It's called Lil Nas X Montero Call Me By Your Name. That was definitely the wrong one. It was like some country music awards. <laughs> it's like, yeah. You know, it just looks like oh, he's wow. a real guy in some like crazy like projection mapped world or whatever. Damn. Yeah, this is like a he's like in a <laughs> fantasy world. It's all this crazy plants and heads coming out of flowers yeah so that's like one example of it that's like a produced film clip version of it um did you see the cardi b grammy performance yeah yeah that was wild so that's the same type of thing it's like all led walls but mm -hmm. 
like done with this crazy technology to the point where it just looks like some oh, yeah. upwardly shit. I mean, I think that's like where the pinnacle of stage production is at this stage. Totally. So totally. Cool. Yeah. That's the future. It's just going to get even more wild. Yeah. She so has- if I had, you know, all the money in the world, I would go down that route for sure. Oh, 100%. Have you ever heard of the light form? No. It's, it's like, uh, it was like the first like at home projection <laughs> mapping of its kind. My buddy who's like really into it, he does like a lot of lasers and stage tech for like Burning Man and a lot of big festivals. Uh, he lives oddly enough in Indianapolis down the road from me. We're good friends and he like turned me on to it. And so we bought it. It was like pretty cheap. It was only like 1400 bucks, I think, for the right. Light Forum X. Uh, but yeah, it, oh, yeah, it looks crazy. Yeah, it's pretty dope. Um, so we bought it and it's very scalable because it's basically just like a webcam that feeds in this tiny little computer and you plug that into the projector and it's just like mirroring what it's looking at. And then yeah, it's you like augmented reality. Yeah. Kind of. Yeah. So it works really well. You can do some really cool. It was actually the smaller yeah. version is designed for like small art installations, but you can do some really crazy stuff. Cause if you buy like a really powerful, like, you know, $20,000 projector, or even if you rent one, you could definitely scale it. There's definitely a learning curve. Um, it's not as easy out of the box as they make it look on their website, but uh, we've had some pretty interesting results playing with it. And I would like to be able to, if I had a nice enough projector, I was be able to be in a venue for like a good six or seven hours before a show could totally pull it off. Yeah, I mean, this shit just looks nuts. Like this light form box 1080p shit I'm just looking at now where this dude's like flipping around a box. And like, yeah, I think I've seen this before. But yeah, this kind of stuff is like, you know, the route that I would go with with a stage show if I had a lot of money. Because yeah. this is like the craziest looking shit, you know. It is. I, are you, I don't know what the newest one is called, but they just came out with a new one. It's actually... um like at home use but i'm sure it could be scalable too for like arenas mm. uh and rooms but you stick it to like the ceiling in the middle of the room and it's like a 360 projector so it's actually you can sync it up to commands it has a microphone so you could do voice commands and sync it to like siri or whatever and be like hey uh siri turn on the coffee pot or whatever or hey like show me a video of this on youtube and it literally will project on the wall wherever you're standing and like face the wall where you're looking and just like instantly pop up a screen so you can start watching something or it'll like move lights around it does crazy stuff damn yeah this shit is uh, yeah they're doing it right i think i think in a, a couple of years you're going to probably hear and see a lot more of their stuff coming out yeah that makes sense i yeah i feel like at some point this stuff will, will become pretty uh accessible to people without cardi b money yeah, Cardi B. Not a lot of us have that kind of dough just floating around. It must exactly. be nice. Yeah. But where do you see, I guess, music technology, I guess, back on the studio side of things, like in a couple years or even like 10, 20 years from now, like changing the way, do you think it'll change the way people produce or like? Yeah, I mean, I think it's going to go to phones, right? Like, I think um, we're already seeing that. There's just like crazy amounts of apps on on your phone now where you can use like five finger gesticulation to do a bunch of crazy shit like this. You know? Oh, that's cool. What app is that? This is PC eleven. Like I think you'll see this kind of stuff um with DAWs more, uh, where you just have them on your phone. You know, like Andrew Huang just put that one out called Flip. And that's pretty solid. It's like a decent DAW on your phone. And there's another one called Drambo, which Richard Devine got me onto. That's really cool. Uh, there's just so many like insane apps at this point. And phones are starting to just get like crazy powerful. And same with um, I, uh, I, iPads, right? Like the latest iPad has the exact same processor chip in it as the latest MacBook. Like they have this... Yeah. this you, you were just saying like your MacBook is, is like crazy powered. I'm pretty sure the latest iPad is the same. So it's like, I didn't know. Do they have an M1 iPad? I didn't even know if that was a thing. There's definitely an iPad that's as powerful as like one of the MacBook. Uh, uh, sorry, it's the MacBook. Yeah, you're, you're right. The iPad Pro does. Yeah. 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 So, I mean, in that case, like, you know, why shouldn't there be like a crazy five fingered touch fucking DAW that would run the exact same on iOS as it would on Mac OS? You know? Right. No, I mean, that's true. We're just going to, go there to where like you know especially with stuff like Neuralink coming out um where we can just like kind of fully connect into these really powerful machines 
and just be able to create music very easily with our fingers. Would you ever get Neuralink embedded in your brain? Yes, but probably like I was saying before with the MacBooks, like I'll wait a few versions before <laughs> yeah, yeah. jumping. Maybe like give them a few versions to iron out all the kinks and right. once I'm in. No, definitely. I think I would want to wait a couple of years before they smooth out all the people whose brains get fried on accident or some weird something happens. Like yeah. just the thought of plugging a microchip into my brain just it's one of those things where it's just kind of like mm, I don't know if I could jump on that right away. I'd have to test I'd have to watch other people fail first or succeed. Right. One sec, I gotta go turn this bread again. <laughs> no, you're cool, man. Go get that bread. Finagle that bagel. Hey, Bill's cat. How's it going? Should lay down a sick beat for us. Let's hear it. Give us like the meow mix. It's like give us a good hairball coughing sample. <laughs> All right, back. Um, bail and like. No, that's totally cool. We're short on time. Um, yeah, I've just been sitting here talking to your cat. <laughs> um, yeah, well, like one thing that. I know a lot of people follow you for, especially your tutorials and things is like with experimental bass music, sound design stuff. So I'd love to pick your brain, even if you could just give us a couple quick tips. Like if somebody's really trying to dial in their bass and just like really check it, like what are some things or tips you offer a lot of producers that come to you when it comes to that? Uh, I think one important thing is just making sure your sub level is, well, first of all, making sure that your sub is separated from your bass. Uh, so putting a high pass filter on everything that's not your sub and then, you know, your sub can take under the, uh, over that range. And then using spectrum uh, with the range control to set the level of your sub. And I have a tutorial about that. It's kind of hard to explain without watching. Sure. Talking about. So if you, yeah, <clears throat> if you want to watch it, it's just called. Uh, if you type in Mr. Bill spectrum tutorial into Google, it's the first thing that comes up. The, the thing is called metering subs using spectrum and then there's another uh another video that that is just called make insane subs yeah that, i watched that that was really good that was a good one too. that was a good tutorial too for sure yes yeah, so that one also um like those two videos should be enough i think to <laughs> to get your bass sounding okay yeah because usually um i find when people say bass they usually mean mid bass they don't right. usually mean the right but uh, the sub is kind of like the bass, uh, and the mid bass is really just anything. It can be whatever. Yeah. No, it's funny. Just, You're right. Cause if, uh, if you didn't have mid range or treble, bass music would be really boring. You wouldn't actually hear anything on most speakers. <laughs> yeah. That's very true. Yeah. What people should really say when they love bass music is that they just love like the harmonic tonality of bass that's resonating above like 200 Hertz, right? Something like exactly. that. Exactly. Yeah, Megan Trainer had it all wrong. She she didn't even know. <laughs> okay. All about that bass. Yeah, well, like uh, you use a lot of audio effect racks too, right? When you're treating your bass, I do. Yeah, and recently I've been separating frequencies a lot more again, which is something I did a lot back in the day, and then I haven't like messed around with a ton in the last few years. But um, after watching some recent Cohen sound tutorials, I'm back into using audio effect racks to separate stuff into frequency ranges like low, high, mid and stuff, and then affecting them all separately and whatnot. Mm -hmm. And yeah, I've been finding that to be a pretty sweet, um, uh, pretty cool technique. Yeah. I was listening to your podcast a couple episodes ago. I think it was Minnesota or whoever it was. And yeah, you did mention that you joined Cohen Sound's Patreon, right? He has a lot of tutorials on there. Yes, yeah, two guys, but yeah. Or yeah, or yeah, two guys. But I think that's really cool. I mean, that speaks a lot to just the fact of continuing to learn. I mean, somebody like you has been in the game for a long time, but like continuing to find ways to stretch yourself and continue to grow as a uh, producer. Yeah, you can never know everything, right? And I mean, Cohen Sound are going to go down their whole path, and I'm going to go down my whole path. So it's always like interesting for me to be like, all right, like you went down this whole other road. Like, what did you find? <laughs> yeah. Because yeah. I went from you know, my whole road and I found all this shit. So, like, yeah, their sound design is ridiculous too. It's pretty, it is, yeah. pretty top notch. I did a drum cover of their song Starlight, like that came out, what, like eight years ago or something? Yeah, they're brilliant. How are things going with the Legal Beats? That's your label. 
Yeah, it's going good. Um, we've recently just put out our like 20th release or something like that. We've put out like over the last, you know, couple of years. Um, let's see, one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four, five, 20, yeah, about 20 releases. That's pretty good. Yeah. And I'm really happy with how it's going. I think all the covers um, look really nice. I'm like, yeah, pretty happy with how we've curated it in terms of, you know, the sound of all of the releases plus um, like the covers and the artwork surrounding it, I think is like all very clear and um, well branded. You know, I've been, been trying to be very careful with the curation of it to make sure it doesn't turn into just some like random label that puts anything out and has like a bunch of random artworks as covers and stuff like that. Like it's, a, it's a very much like a, a super particular thing. Like if you find the label and you like one of the releases, I want you to be able to go through the entire catalog and just love all of it. Yeah. You know? Like that's, it's like, <clears throat> um, that is true. That is true. Like I, yeah, there's a lot of growing pains that I've seen internally with friends who run labels um but like you have to be sure about what you want to do right like you have to be like super sure about the style that you want to put out and like very sure about um how you want it to look and all that kind of stuff Mm -hmm. yeah you're building a whole nother brand how do you find time between like teaching and producing and running a label and everything else like is there some time machine that you have that nobody knows about or like i just work like a lot of hours but i also hire a lot of people to take a lot of the slack you know i don't don't think it's possible to do all the things that i do just on my own yeah um so i have like you know a web developer like i was saying earlier i work with gardner on Beleagle sounds i work with um two people named uh george sideris i think it's his name he's also friends with gardner and lives in atlanta okay Uh, and another guy called morgan prevost who writes music under the name primo uh, they help me a lot with the Beleagle Beats stuff. Uh, and then for both Beleagle Beats and Beleagle Sounds, we have a three-person art team, which is uh, a guy called Funk, who is on Instagram as GM underscore work. And another guy called Ariella, who is on Instagram as Coral underscore fields. So, and Funny, who does all of my art, which is just at Funny Lab on Instagram. Yeah, I love uh, his style too, by the way. He does some great work for you. Yeah, he's awesome. So yeah, it's just like I don't know, handing off work to other people so we can like scale up the project. You know, mm-hmm. obviously I've been working with my web developer Ben since like the start with the website and stuff. Um, and you know, I have a manager who deals with all of the show stuff. And you know, then I, I, tr- I basically try and make it so like I can keep just dealing with what I do, which is making sounds and making tunes and playing shows and shit like that. Yeah. And then I try to like build the project, but you know, have other people kind of manage those sections. Um, because otherwise, yeah, I would have just zero time. Right. I think like the art of delegation is something I've definitely been learning over the last couple of years. It's extremely important for in the in the arts and the creative industry to be successful for sure. And you're doing a great job of that. So I love the content you're putting out. I know I'm not the only one. I know that our time is short, but dude. Thanks for joining the podcast. Where's the best place for people to connect with you? Uh, just the website, I think. Just mrbillstunes.com. From there, you'll find everything. Right on, man. Yeah, for sure. I'll keep looking for the puns on Twitter. So, <laughs> <laughs> All right, man. Have a good one. Yeah, you too, man. Later. Hey, big thanks again to Mr. Bill and his cat for hanging out on the podcast today. Just want to give you guys a quick reminder, if you want to join my membership, I would be super happy to have you on the other side. I just migrated my new website, liveproducersonline.com, and I'm uploading a lot more downloads with sample packs, effects racks, things I'm building, as well as my video courses and my private Discord, where you can get 24-hour Ableton support when you have questions on your projects. I'm doing track feedback every Thursday for my members. So if you're interested in growing your skills, hanging out with me and other members, go to liveproducersonline.com. Click that fat green button, join the membership. Love to see you on the other side. And yeah, also, if you want to join the newsletter, be the first to know when new episodes come out for the podcast, go to liveproducersonline.com slash newsletter. Would love to see you guys on the other side and have a super dope week. Keep making bangers and I will see you guys next time.